Well, once again, hello to everybody and welcome to the saskagtoday.com roundtable. I'm GX94 Agriculture Director Doug Faulkner. Joining me is Saskag Today's Chief Agricultural Editor Kevin Hirsch and the Agri News Director for 620 CKRM Regina, Ryan Young. Good day, gentlemen, and I hope everybody is doing well today. Good to see you, Doug. Good to see you too. All right, well, let's talk about the latest crop report that came out on Thursday. Saskatchewan doing very well, 68% complete. Does that surprise you at all? I think that the progress has been very quick. There's been some rains in some areas, but by and large, uh, there's been a lot of progress, especially on the west side of the province. And by the time the next crop report rolls out, where do you where do you think the numbers will be, Ryan? It'll be be considerably higher, probably than sixty eight percent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm thinking the southwest region is pretty much going to be done, close to a hundred percent. The west central, not too far behind probably in that uh, high 80s, low 90s percentile. Um, thinking the East Central and Southeast, they're going to be pretty close to, you know, 75% done. And then the Northwest uh, should be able to reach that halfway point. So it wouldn't surprise me at all to see the numbers in those ranges. Speaking of the halfway point, uh, Manitoba last report was only 51% complete. Does that surprise you? My guess would be that you know probably a little later seeding in parts of Manitoba and better crops, uh, especially better than what we see in the west side of Saskatchewan, and better crops just take longer to mature. It's a a very early harvest in Saskatchewan overall, and better crops in Manitoba and a bit more traditional timing there. I would say, Ryan. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that uh, Manitoba is at the halfway point again. You know, they had the later start uh, with all the rains and a little bit of hail as well. So they didn't uh, get the combines out till later on than normal. So but considering all that, I know I've heard the, you know, yield reports like in the northwest, as an example, uh, they're doing pretty well for the most part, I would think anyway. So. Uh, come next crop report, uh, probably, I don't know, be two thirds done, being a little optimist here. Yep, we'll see. I know we had a lot of rains here over the last week or so, just enough to slow guys down. They said it didn't really damage their crops a whole lot, but just, you know, just enough to make them stop and not be able to start up till after lunch, for instance, rather than first thing in the morning. So just that sort of thing is happening in this part of the province anyway. Yeah, the days are, you know, the days are starting to get shorter. We can have, you know, some showers and, and some some humidity. And and also as producers are finishing up in some areas, you know, they, they you can't get to 110% of your harvest. So it, it pulls down how quickly the percentages can rise. So sometimes that uh, that tail end of harvest can take longer than you think if you just follow the trend lines. All right. And when it comes to fertilizer pricing, I know a lot of guys might be starting to look at that. I know there's advantages to purchasing your fertilizer in the fall, uh, maybe a little bit cheaper, but uh, you've been kind of keeping an eye on the prices, Kevin? Yeah, I just uh, actually, as of today, brought in some fertilizer and whether it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And I know lots of people in, in other areas use anhydrous ammonia or use liquid nitrogen. I tend to follow urea prices and they're they're actually they're, they've come up uh they fell all the way through seeding and after seeding and then have started climbing again and are approaching that 800 dollars a ton range and it's a, a great question as to where prices go from here traditionally probably eight or nine years out of ten the price of nitrogen fertilizer is the highest right around spring seeding that april may time frame but last year, that wasn't the case. Uh, some of the highest prices were about November of last year at about $1,100 or $1,150 a ton for urea. Uh, and then that declined uh, right through uh, right through seeding. So it, it's, uh, it's always a guess as to when you should be purchasing your fertilizer. Traditional wisdom is you buy it late summer, early fall, in the winter, it's going to be cheaper than it is in the spring. 
maybe that will get back to that this year, but it certainly wasn't last year. And over the recent history, we've seen a tremendous range in fertilizer prices. And I tend to follow Alberta Agriculture's Farm Input Price Survey, and it's not going to be accurate for every location or accurate across uh, uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but it's the best indicator of retail prices. And, you know, in the last few years, uh, well, here the low of, was in uh, in recent times was October of 2020 at $550 for urea. The peak was $1,350, and that was in April of 2022. So a tremendous range that makes a tremendous difference in your cost base uh, if you can buy fertilizer cheaply rather than paying the big price for it. And do you also find that way you get to yourself a, a bit of a, an expense that you can fit in on this year's income taxes then, Kevin, if you buy it now? Well, that will be uh, important for some producers. I, I think that that uh, tends to maybe be, actually be a little bit overrated because uh, an incorporated farm, it, it becomes less and less important as to whether the, you know, trying to get an expense in a particular year or, or juggling that because your marginal tax rate stays the same up to $500,000. So more and more producers are incorporated. And I think then they're, they aren't making necessarily last minute purchases to change your income tax situation. And they're less likely to want to defer grain sales for the same reason. It just uh, under a corporate income tax rate, it, it's not nearly as important as it was on the progressive tax rate that, that you uh, ran into as a sole, sole proprietorship. Just kind of curious, Kevin, uh, when you do these analysis, uh, is it easier to kind of gauge or project what uh, these fertilizer prices would be compared to, say, like, you know, futures, uh, grain prices, that sort of thing? Well, there's all sorts of information that flows around if you look at the analysis and and some of it, some analysts are saying it's going higher and some analysts are saying it's going lower at any given time. Back uh, when prices have gone really high, some of that was due to the Ukraine situation and the turmoil there, uh, tremendously high natural gas prices in, in Europe and shutting down the nitrogen plants because they weren't able to make any money at those high natural gas prices. But that was overdone and that situation turned around much more rapidly than anybody expected. So we have uh, we spent a lot of time, and I know you guys spend lots of time talking to grain market analysts it's difficult to find uh, good, accurate, meaningful information on where fertilizer prices are likely to go. There's a guy named Josh Linville that gets a fair bit of attention, and he does he does some of that. But there seems to be so many factors involved that those analysts don't necessarily get it right. And and I, I've seen you know producers and fertilizer dealers make some tremendous mistakes over the years. Is it a good idea to get it in the fall? And I guess that might prevent the fact that uh, you might have some shortages come spring. Is that an issue ever? It's it's often talked about that there, there could be spot shortages and logistical issues. And you sometimes see that on a minor basis, but that has failed to materialize in any big way. You know, you, meet, you want a particular blend or you want sulfur that isn't available that afternoon or whatever at your place because the, the truck was delayed. So it is a scramble, but... Oftentimes that's been used as a, you know, you, you better get it now because it, it might be hard to get in the spring. That's never materialized, but I do appreciate having it on the farm and not having to run into the, the dealership to pick it up and be caught be behind three other semis that need to load up and be there for a couple of hours when I could be doing other things. So I, I do like to have it uh, on farm, although dry fertilizer uh, if you, if with moisture issues, it can be difficult to, uh, it can clump up and be difficult to get out of the bin. And sometimes you say, man, I wish I was just picking it up in town and didn't have to deal with all this chipping it out of the bin. So there's pluses and minuses. But uh, generally speaking, if you buy at the right time, there's good money to be saved. Last year or this spring was, was an exception. If you'd waited to the last minute, you'd have actually had the best nitrogen fertilizer prices. Anything else on that topic you wanted to add, Kevin? No, no, that's that's about the extent of my wisdom, Doug. <laughs> All right. Well, something else we were going to touch on was the WASDE report that came out uh, 
last week. Uh, was there anything that jumped out at you from there? Ryan, what did what did you see in there? I don't think uh, I think when you talked to some of the analysts, they said it didn't really move the needle all that much. Yeah, that was uh, specifically Adam Bacallo with uh, PI Financial. I asked him just plainly, like, does the WASD report have any effect on the grain markets? And he simply said, no, nah, not really. It doesn't have a, an immediate impact on uh, canola and wheat futures, especially. So uh, that was kind of a bit of a surprise. I kind of thought, uh, you know, with the WASD report, I thought there was going to be, uh, you know, some, uh, if not high movement, at least some moderate movement. But the fact that there's very little, it uh, kind of surprises me. Yeah, whether it's WASD or whatever it is, uh, canola prices continue to drop like a rock. I think I remember talking with you guys way back when and suggesting that didn't know where canola prices were going to go, but they were probably going to end up somewhere in that 18 down to $16 range. And we almost saw 18 and now we're almost seeing $16 a bushel at, uh, at uh, inland terminals just because the price has dropped so much. And I suspect that a lot of producers who were looking to deliver canola off the combine or soon after combining have uh, re-evaluated that the way canola prices have been dropping over the last couple of weeks. Absolutely, yeah. It's been really plummeting. There was a couple of days where it rebounded, and now as I see it's really dropped again, like so significantly today. So. Yes, and it's uh, those increases it's almost like a dead cat bounce. They weren't very high on the on the bounce up, the, but it, it continues to have some big moves down many days. Anything you wanted to add on that one, Ryan? Yeah, another thing that kind of stood out to me was just uh, the USDA slashing their global wheat production estimate by 7 million tons. Uh, Kevin, uh, when, when you hear that kind of statistic, uh, does that uh, really stand out to you at all? Well, some people suggest that things are pretty tight in the wheat complex, tighter than we, we thought in world wheat stocks. We haven't really seen that uh, materialize in any meaningful way as far as price increases in wheat. But maybe that's yet to come. Maybe the, the market is underestimating how short wheat is. Maybe Maybe wheat is the sleeper. All right. Well, I know, Ryan, something you were following pretty closely was the Canadian Cattle Association and a couple of other groups that started that campaign called Say No to a Bad Deal. And that's, I guess, regarding the United Kingdom trying to get into the CPTPP. Uh, did you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah. So the three cattle groups, uh, as you mentioned, the Canadian Cattle Association, as well as the Canadian Meat Council and the National uh, Cattle Feeders Association, uh, they launched this campaign to really raise awareness about what's going on in trade talks between Canada and the United Kingdom. Uh, the chief issue at hand here is uh, the UK not accepting uh, the Canada's food safety standards. Um, I was talking uh, with uh, Nathan Finney about that uh, last week. He's the president of the Canadian Cattle Association, and he says it's kind of ironic, you know, because uh, the UK uses the exact same food standards for other products, but for beef and pork, they, they don't. So it's kind of a, a little bit confusing. So um, another uh, kind of perplexing thing, too, about this is um, Canada supporting the UK's bid to join the CPTPP, which kind of goes against conventional wisdom, right? Uh, trade barriers, you want to try and sort that out first before, you know, getting on to a multinational uh, trade deal and yet they're they're accepting them so when i asked uh nathan and uh, uh will Lowe with the cattle feeders association about that they're just kind of perplexed they don't really know why uh that's happening so unless canada has some sort of trump card that uh, we don't know about it's kind of confusing we've seen the same thing with the canada eu trade deal where the rest of Europe, of course, now the UK is out of the European Union, and, and that's why this separate deal would be. But same thing has happened with uh, the other European nations. They've used phytosanitary issues to block beef, and they're they're sending us more beef than we're sending them. And that certainly wasn't uh, uh, wasn't the trade flow that was promoted as that deal was being put together. And you mentioned trade flow. That's another interesting point about this, too, is uh, the UK has been able to uh, export $50 million worth of uh, British beef into Canada. 
And yet Canada hasn't had any market access at all to the United Kingdom. So uh, it just kind of adds more confusion to this issue. So the groups are saying uh, we're not really accepting the UK into uh, the bilateral trade deal and the CPTPP until it gets resolved. And if it doesn't get resolved, they expect uh, the Canadian government to compensate producers and processors for the losses that will result in those trade barriers. And interestingly, there's precedent for that because uh, the dairy and supply managed industries uh, receive compensation for, uh, uh, you know, supposed uh, uh, measures within uh, those trade deals that were supposed to uh, limit uh, their sales. And now, I don't I don't really believe that that has happened, but they've received massive amounts of compensation. So I think the beef industry has an interesting case should this trade deal go ahead. Yeah, and uh, I asked Will Lowe uh, towards the end of the interview I did with him uh, last week, um, you know, $50 million, you guys mentioned that. Uh, is that kind of what you're looking for to compensate producers and processors? And he said, yeah, it's, uh, it's a start, but uh, if we can get more, you know, that would be fine. And Kevin, uh, speaking of trade deals, uh, we've heard that Canada and India have backed off on their trade talks. And I know a lot of pulse growers and pulse organizations out there were not very happy to hear about that. Uh, what's your take on all that? Have you heard anything uh, rumbling? Certainly, there was work towards a trade deal that was uh, ended abruptly. The the our Prime Minister and Prime Minister Modi of India seem to have a very cool relationship, and their last meetings were not cordial. And it's a big worry for especially Saskatchewan, especially lentil sales, also pea sales. I used to take a huge amount of peas, but the, most of those are actually going to China now. But a huge customer for lentils, a potential big customer again someday for peas. And Saskatchewan does, and most, uh, not most, but probably, I think the number is something like 40% of uh, Canadian exports to India come from Saskatchewan. So it's a huge deal for us. And it's a very understanding that the Pulse organizations would be encouraging work on, on a trade deal because India's rules and India's restrictions, again, similar to what we talked about in Europe and the UK, can be onerous to get around. And it's always great to have a set of rules when you're doing trade. I, I do find it a little unnerving when you realize that we seem to have cool relationships with both China and India now, which is what about one third of the world's population that's you don't want to be ticking off these people too much if you can help it. That's for sure. Well, I don't know what the, the answer is. Uh, certainly, there's all sorts of political and human rights issues there, but maybe we need to separate that from the export of food. Maybe that, that should be separate and aside from some of these other issues. I, I don't know what the solution is. All right, and to wrap things up, Ryan, you went out a couple of times last week for the country cookout. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, I went out a couple of times. Uh, I chatted with... Uh, Brad Lechner, he's from the Balgoni area, and I was talking with him a little bit about his harvest and how that's going. Um, he said it's going pretty good, uh, really good. There are some words there that I cannot repeat here, uh, you know, not suitable for work, obviously, but he was pretty proud of the yields that he got uh, wheat, for example. Uh, he was saying that he was getting between 60 and 70 bushels an acre. Um, canola remains to be seen because, uh, that would be the last thing that, uh, he's going to harvest before the season is done for him. Uh, actually a funny story. When we pulled into his, uh, farmyard, he was still out in the middle of the field, uh, harvesting his crops. So, uh, he came on a little bit later, but uh, really nice guy as well. Uh, he was also a little bit guilty about, uh, saying the yields, uh, considering, uh, what other producers are facing, say in the West central and Southwest parts. It's kind of a similar, um, excuse me, similar thing with George Hines from Munster. He was also saying that he was feeling pretty guilty about, uh, you know, saying his yields, but they were pretty good as well. He said barley is around 100, bu 100 bushels an acre, acre. Uh, spring wheat, 70 to 80. Oats is the real big one here, 125 to 130 bushels an acre. And canola, he estimates uh, about in the 50 to 60 range. And uh, later on in the week, uh, I talked with Donald Bailey near Bengoff. Uh, he is an organic farmer, actually. His son 
uh, Daniel is a uh, conventional farmer. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. You have one conventional farmer and an organic farmer. <clears throat> Excuse me, trying to cough there. Um, anyway, so Donald was saying, uh, you know, some yields were not great. Others were surprisingly good considering the dry conditions down there. Uh, Dur conventional Durham was right around 25 bushels an acre and organic wheat was right around eight bushels an acre. So considering the circumstances, it was okay, but obviously could be better. And we out, uh, went out to supper in the field just uh, near Roblin, Manitoba on Wednesday. Actually, they were a mile in from the Saskatchewan boundary. So their combines were actually in Saskatchewan, but we were in their farmyard in Manitoba. So I don't know what kind of confusion that causes with the time zone difference, but I guess you start when you start, right? So <laughs> in the morning and... Uh, one of the other things I went to this week was uh, the flour mill here in uh, Yorkton, the old brick flour mill. It's 125 years old this year, and they had a sod turning. They're going to add on an, an interpretive station to it, so it's going to going to look like a railway station kind of thing. And they want it to be able to host functions there, and it's going to be an interpretive center, and people can come through and and learn about agriculture and how that mill first started up. And I, I do believe they have it actually working. It's in working order now. They put a lot of work into it. So it's pretty interesting. This old flour mill that's been sitting in Yorkton here. You can see it out my window. <laughs> Ryan knows what I'm talking about because he's the leader. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's great to see. Uh, and they think it's going to be a, a great tourist attraction once it's all up and running as well. So anything else you guys want to add? A future meeting at the old flour mill in Yorkton. Sounds yeah. like a good plan. Yeah. We'll yeah, it definitely some... sounds like a good uh, weekend ordeal. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this week's edition of saskagtoday.com Roundtable. I'm Doug Polkner, the GX94 Agriculture Director, joined by Kevin Hirsch, our Chief Agricultural Editor for saskagtoday.com. And of course, Ryan Young, who is the Agri-News Director at 620 CKRM. So long, everyone. <laughs>